So good afternoon, uh, everyone, and very welcome to the uh, webinar, CEPS webinar of today, the Recovery Fund and the Stability Pact. Uh, this webinar, uh, I think, could not be uh, set for a better time. Uh, after four days of uh, very tough negotiations, uh, the EU Council has reached an agreement uh, on uh, possibly the, the largest package uh, that the EU uh, ever uh, was ever made uh, was ever able to uh, to put together in, in response to uh, to a crisis. Uh, the next generation EU um, uh, plan has been uh, approved with some changes with respect to what was the original uh, proposal of the Commission, but yet we have uh, a very large uh, plan to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, to, to discuss uh, the decision of, of the Council, but also what are the implications in terms of uh, investment, but also uh, in terms of uh, the impact on uh, the fiscal framework of, of the EU. We have uh, two excellent speakers, um, Paolo Gentiloni, Commissioner for the Economy um, at the European Commission, and uh, Nils Tigesen, who is the, the Chairman of the European Fiscal Board. Uh, but before giving the floor to them, I hand over to Daniel Cross, uh, SEPS Director, who will moderate the event. Daniel, the floor is yours. Uh, many thanks. It's indeed a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, uh, these two speakers at our webinar uh, today. Um, of course, uh, we all know the background by now, uh, the economic uh, crisis which we are all facing the fact that it is uh, perhaps symmetric in the sense that everybody had the virus, but asymmetric in terms uh, of the impact and asymmetric in terms of the abilities of countries to withstand it. And one point I think was very important in the debate over the last month, which was that the usual way until now, the EU or rather the EU area was helping its member countries was by giving them cheap credits. And one argument which has been made repeatedly over the last months was giving additional credits to countries which already have a very large debt burden doesn't make sense from an economic point of view and maybe also not from a political point of view. And I think that is what brought us to this big innovation uh, uh, which we have uh, now at least in an agreement among the heads of state. Namely, that for the first time the EU will uh, make very large transfers uh, to uh, countries uh, in need, uh, over and above uh, the transfers which we are used to to poorer regions under the EU's cohesion policy. And I think uh, who better than Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni to tell us more about uh, this agreement, uh, a bit of the background and what he expects to be the next steps. Uh, Paolo Gentiloni, I think uh, we will ask you now to give us a short presentation of these issues. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, uh, Cinzia, and uh, Professor Tigesen, uh, and uh, all of you. Uh, yeah, indeed, we are, we are in the day after, so it's very interesting to, uh, to discuss. Um, and uh, politicians and journalists uh, used um, yesterday and today very frequently uh, the term historical. Um, and I think indeed that this um, is uh, this was an historical step. Um, we will have now uh, the Commission uh, borrowing in financial markets. Um, beginning in September, October this year, and then in 2021, 2022, uh, something like um, 850 billion euros, if we count also the sure mechanism. Uh, and this is this deal um, was the conclusion of a, an extraordinary, uh, in my opinion, uh, four months. Uh, of uh, strong and fast uh, reactions from the European institutions, uh, including obviously the ECB. Um, this uh, European reaction uh, enabled uh, 
um, and complemented the action of member states, which was um, also very strong. So you know the uh, content of this next generation EU that was approved yesterday, uh, 750 billion, uh, 390 plus 360 of loans. May be useful to note um, a few details uh, that were uh, decided uh, in these four days of negotiation. One is the fact that uh, we have two different uh, shares of this uh, uh, facility, the recovery uh, facility, 70% um, with commitments in 2021 and 2022, uh, and with the allocation keys that were discussed, were proposed by the Commission, and 30% uh, uh, should be committed in uh, 2023, uh, um, but with different allocation keys connected not to unemployment, but to uh, effective GDP loss uh, in uh, 2020 and 2021. So this will make them uh, uh, responding, answering to question to be more uh, updated. Uh, then uh, we will have 10% of this uh, recovery and resilient facility anticipated uh, in 2021, sort of pre-financing, possibly connected to the approval of the plans, but this is uh, not yet decided. Um, uh, then also interesting to note that 30% of the overall package approved yesterday morning, uh, which is something more than 1.8 a uh, trillion, 30% uh, of the overall package uh, should be on climate-related uh, projects. Um, and uh, fourth uh, thing that I want to note is that uh, the, the um, uh, decision process was very much discussed, intensively discussed in these four days at the end. Uh, as you know, we have the plans that are approved um, by uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Council with um, a qualified majority uh, through an implementing act uh, after the proposal of the Commission. And then we have the execution uh, and the, the, so the disbursement, the milestones that are approved uh, uh, under the comitology, so-called comitology process. So the commission is there on the lead. Uh, a lot of discussion on this break uh, system, but at the end it is not uh, something uh, allowing veto rights or uh, provide, uh, requiring uh, unanimity uh, vote. So the substance is the council approved in qualified majority the plan, and the Commission well, implementing a Commission proposal, and the Commission is on the lead on the disbursement and milestones. Finally, we have also negative aspects uh, of a few things connected to, uh, especially on cuts on some innovative and interesting tools and programs, for example, the support solvency support instrument. instrument um, uh, and other programs uh, that we hope uh, to compensate with uh, the uh, amount of money of the next generation EU. But anyway, they were uh, a cost to be paid to the agreement because it was obvious in these four days that at the end an agreement was reached and this was really, from my point of view, extraordinary and I repeat historical. But at the same time, in these four days, all the differences within the Union were very openly exhibited. Uh, and I, I think we've perhaps never seen such strong differences in the, in the club. Now, I think we have three phases. One is um, the final um, approval, uh, European Parliament, national parliaments. 
the raising in financial markets. Um, this is uh, first. Second, we'll be coordinating these plans uh, with our country-specific recommendations and with our uh, strategic goals. So the, the resilience, uh, digital transition, Green Deal, um, and this coordination is absolutely crucial to uh, give uh, this uh, historical decision a real historical uh, dimension. Uh, if we uh, are able to coordinate these plans. And third, uh, the definition of the package of uh, uh, own resources, uh, which uh, has now an unprecedented window of, of opportunity uh, due to the fact that uh, several countries are asking that the process of repayments begins uh, soon and clearly. And so the initiative, which is not at all easy, of uh, uh, providing new own resources will be encouraged. Our general goals are, I think, uh, very clear uh, through this uh, recovery instrument. Uh, one is to make the, our union more competitive and sustainable. Two is to prevent uh, uh, the risk of a, a greater fragmentation, as uh, Daniel was also saying in his uh, introductory words. And third, uh, to provide uh, teeth to our um, uh, fiscal policy coordination uh, to to try to connect our fiscal policy coordination to um, this um, large, huge amount of uh, uh, of money. Um, finally, uh, also to uh, to give uh, them the floor uh, to Professor uh, Tigesen, uh, implementation will not. Uh, happen in a void, uh, but in a um, challenging and dramatic uh, economic situation where uncertainty and confidence are still struggling and uncertainty at the moment uh, risks to uh, prevail. Uh, so implementation of the plan will cross uh, many other issues. Uh, and, for example, next year, we should, uh, at the same time, uh, deliver on the uh, national um, re resilience and recovery uh, plans, uh, decide our fiscal stance, uh, which obviously should continue to be uh, supportive, uh, and uh, the timing of this uh, general escape clause, uh, how long will it uh, be in force? Uh, and third, uh, so the, the resilience and the recovery plans, the uh, general escape clause and fiscal stance, and third, the conclusion of the review of our um, uh, six and two packs, uh, which is uh, which began in January, yet now it is a little bit was a little bit frozen, but will restart obviously in the next month. So next year, all these issues should be, uh, I don't know in, if in the same period, but addressed in some way. And I think that we have two uh, general goals to uh, to to have in mind. One is to avoid. Uh, a, the risk of a double dip recession, uh, so to avoid um, to uh, anticipate, um, to wrongly anticipate uh, decisions. Um, and here, I think uh, EFB contribution was very interesting when we discussed also in the college. And second is uh, the necessity to uh, find ways to uh, protect uh, our public investment, because indeed we will have uh, a shortfall of private investment. This was very clearly assessed 
in our assessment of the needs that was at the basis of the proposal of the Commission for the Next Generation EU. And to address this shortfall, we need more than ever to uh, protect our uh, public uh, uh, investment. So um, this is, I think, um, two goals that we have to keep uh, in mind for our um, next year uh, um, uh, discussion. And I think that the contribution uh, given from the European Fiscal Board was, was, was from this point of view, uh, very important. Uh, Daniel. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. And if I heard correctly, you didn't even use once the word solidarity. Um, or was I wrong? <laughs> I give it for granted because on the, the basis of all this initiative uh, was uh, solidarity. Then there is, of course, a common interest and not only solidarity. But I am truly convinced that, especially in the decision of uh, some leaders um, in Europe, uh, the uh, the value of solidarity was important to, to take not only the common interest, which is, that is obviously there. So Thank I you. didn't mention it because I give it for granted. And I think also the Italians are feeling this. Thank you very much. Uh, some countries in the North where solidarity was, per se, given in a more magnanimous way than in others. Um, let me uh, uh, come back to uh, one thing you said, and that I think might be interesting for Niels to look at. Uh, you mentioned that there will be, of course, a link between uh, national fiscal policy and uh, the contributions from the EU under the next generation EU. And uh, one of the issues uh, perhaps Niels wants to take up is uh, whether, in a certain sense, uh, the contributions or the transfers from the EU should be substitutes or complements to national fiscal efforts. Um, so, Niels, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Daniel, and thank you to SEPS for organizing this uh, webinar, indeed, at the most appropriate time. Um, I should say I, I cannot really speak on behalf of the European Fiscal Board about the recent package because we have not had time to react to it. But I'm on safe grounds by saying that uh, we approved strongly the Commission's initiative of late May, uh, the even larger package that was proposed at that time. So uh, I want to use this opportunity also to congratulate uh, Commissioner Gentiloni for uh, the result that has come out. Um, I shall try to avoid the more lyrical terms, but this is clearly a momentous uh, event for the reasons that uh, uh, the Commission already mentioned, uh, the idea of um, joint borrowing and the use of uh, uh, direct uh, grants to countries in some cases where the debt levels are already very high. Um, in the European Fiscal Board, we have long been advocates of some joint fiscal capacity. Um, simply in terms of stabilization, some shocks are too large to be handled simply by national fiscal policy. I should return to the interaction of joint and national policies. Um, but the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, was clearly a case that demonstrated that and convinced uh, most countries that we were in a special situation requiring uh, joint efforts. That also went beyond what the European Central Bank could be expected to do, even though many of us had probably underestimated how much the European Central Bank has been able to do. But we should not necessarily want them to do as much as they can, because if uh, there's a need for joint fiscal policies, then governments should take up, step up and take that responsibility. Uh, if you compare to the discussion uh, before the pandemic, uh, you can see how far we have moved. Stabilization was not considered at that time a joint task. Uh, that was a view of a number of uh, governments in the pre-pandemic period. 
And the main argument at that time was that many countries had shown inadequate willingness to use uh, the good times to build up fiscal buffers. And the most recent example was a good period of 2017, 19. Uh, but now as we look back, I think one can say that uh, even if all countries had followed the strict rules of the uh, stability and growth pact uh, Maastricht criteria, um, then the uh, uh, world that was revealed by the pandemic attack would have revealed such weak weaknesses in public finances that something like this would also have become necessary uh, in that case. Uh, before the crisis, we had almost um, pathetic contortions between governments over very small uh, budget items of solidarity. Uh, and that has clearly changed uh, dramatically. But this package is more than just uh, stabilization. It is uh, beginning to address also the two other dimensions in the fiscal policies that we discuss at the national level in a more systematic way. Uh, one is the allocation of resources, the emphasis on investment, protecting investment. The other is uh, the distribution of uh, the joint uh, efforts between countries. Um, um, there's been uh, more recently a lot of emphasis in the uh, EU on the provision of public goods as a major element in the, uh, uh, in the program that is now developing. Um, in the past, uh, investment has been uh, cut after the financial crisis, it never quite uh, recovered. Uh, it's postponed, it's a natural political reaction at times of budget stringency to postpone investment. And we can see now that if you allow for broad estimates of the deterioration, the depreciation of the capital stock that exists, the uh, Euro area and the U European Union had almost zero net investment over the past uh, seven years. So clearly the uh, initiative of a new generation EU with emphasis on uh, building the capacity to grow uh, was a natural one that helped very much to convince governments of this. Um, uh, and this is also a new departure because uh, governments don't like, national governments don't like uh, the European Union to determine or interfere into the distribution of expenses. They uh, like to take those decisions themselves. But once the arguments are strong enough, uh, we can see that uh, they will, this argument will be modified. As to the distribution, uh, we also now see more detailed assessments of the need of countries, individual countries, than in the past examples of uh, uh, funds that have such some distributive concepts, uh, elements, they have been very much sharpened and they were further developed in fact, during the European Council meeting of the last uh, few days. So all of this is uh, clearly a uh, major uh, progress. Uh, uh, we can discuss for a long time whether the new initiatives are primarily a stabilization initiative or whether they are uh, emphasizing these other aspects, the allocation or the distribution. They are clearly both. But one uh, reason for emphasizing uh, the, the new elements are that uh, public investment, whatever you may think about the need for them, they are not very suitable maybe for short-term stabilization. They take some time to implement and plan for. We should see how well that can be organized. That's one crucial uh, dimension. So uh, clearly uh, this plan is much more than short-term stabilization. And in that context, I should mention that the European Fiscal Board, we have long voiced a preference for a more permanent uh, ability to do this. And, and we see with some concern the limitation in time, but that was a necessary compromise to be made at this point. If the experiences are good, hopefully these facilities will remain uh, available uh, in, the, in the future in some form. If, uh, of course, we have a really serious situation once more. In the European Fiscal Board, uh, as the Commissioner has already said, we take an interest in the future of the rules-based framework and governance for national fiscal policies. And that includes very much the uh, new balance between national and joint uh, efforts. Um, currently, of course, the rules are uh, not really operational. They were they wisely suspended by the commission in uh, uh, March this year. Uh, we applaud that decision and we think that uh, it's not the time as yet to uh, modify that uh, uh, 
in the application of the general escape clause. But clearly the time will come uh, to, to discuss uh, when that should be done. And, and we've argued in a recent report that um, this time could come and is likely to come indeed uh, on the reasonably benign assumptions about the assumption of growth and the uh, positive initial experience with the new joint programs. Uh, it could happen as early as beginning of 2021. So uh, at that time, we would hope that uh, at least the governments would be prepared to discuss the criteria for deactivating again the general escape clause and coming back to a more rules-based uh, system that would be uh, uh, very useful. Uh, the recovery fund for whatever its merits will not have removed uh, the need for careful monitoring of the national fiscal policies, nor will it have removed the need, in fact, for continuing fiscal stimulus. Uh, in 2021, but uh, things begin to, to need some uh, uh, monitoring again. Um, we do believe, therefore, that these rules could be uh, reviewed in the uh, uh, next winter, and I saw some support for that in what the Commissioner just said. Hopefully the recovery will then be underway, and uh, we can break the uh, inertia of saying this is not the time to uh, come back to discussing uh, the rules. The three things that I see as uh, the main implications for the rules uh, of the new joint facility is that we need to simplify the rules somewhat, rely less on uh, uh, policy indicators that are very hard to observe and will be even harder to observe as long as they rely on potential growth. Uh, second, to uh, also devise methods of monitoring uh, private investment and public investment within the framework of the national plans, giving more life again here to the recommendations of a more structural nature in the country specific recommendations. And uh, finally, to find some way of anchoring the long term adjustments of countries in a way that is uh, both uh, realistic but also uh, certainly disciplining in the long term, but less rigorous possibly than the debt ratios that existed just before. So I concur completely with uh, what the Commissioner said, there will be more teeth now in the uh, administration of the, uh, uh, the Commission's administration, notably in the, the uh, country specific recommendations. And there will be the link also, as uh, you hinted, Daniel, uh, in your remarks, there will be the link that uh, uh, the national rules should be observed broadly by countries uh, in order to keep their access to at least the grant-based part of the new recovery program. That would certainly be what we would hope in the European Fiscal Board, I imagine, once we get to discuss these issues in more detail. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Niels. Um, I noticed that you said that the countries should observe broadly the fiscal rules, not strictly. Uh, maybe we come back to that later. Um, but the, the, the precise or the question, the general question which I have is the following. Um, as we noticed at the very beginning, the real need for solidarity arose because, because some member countries already have a very high debt level, which makes it difficult for them to react to shocks. Now we are going probably into a period where even when the crisis is over, debt levels will be higher than before. At that point, so let's say end 2021, do we think that it is even more important than before to reduce debt levels? Because experience has shown that very large shocks come unanticipated. Or do we believe that because of low interest rates and an implicit EU guarantee, Reducing national debt levels is less important than before. This is a question for me, I take it. First for you and then the Commissioner. Okay, let's so hear the Commissioner first. And the Commissioner, you yes. uh, Well, I, I think um, uh, as um, we, we always say in our uh, diplomatic sentences that uh, time is of essence. Uh, so the, the problem is um, that for sure uh, we uh, 
should uh, monitor the situation and fight, find the right way and the right timing to uh, bring the process uh, of um, that sustainability uh, in the right track. This is uh, something that um, no member state should forget in these uh, uh, very uh, extraordinary uh, situation. But how, uh, with what kind of graduality, uh, and when uh, this process is um, to, uh, to be decided, is, uh, I think, very difficult to discuss today because we are um, uh, honestly in a completely, uh, still in a completely uncertain situation. And um, the, uh, I think that the, the main driver of this common reaction uh, that was to try to avoid that a, a symmetric and common crisis uh, could uh, uh, strengthen the differences among member states. Uh, this driver is uh, still very, very strong and it is there. So, of course, um, the, the, as I said before, the risk that we have absolutely to avoid and that uh, we ran in previous crises. Um, I, I, uh, I read a, a few days ago an article uh, from uh, an economist they I know very well uh, because he is uh, my head of cabinet um, uh, on, the, on the risk of this um, recession, uh, of, of a double recession um, created by uh, uh, too uh, much anticipated decisions. So my answer is, uh, yes, we have to, uh, to keep this uh, target in mind. We have to go back to a uh, path, path to uh, sus sustainable debt, uh, but we have to do this at the right time and with the necessary graduality which is the right time and what is the necessary graduality, I think uh, nobody is able to, to tell this now. And it will be the discussion of next year, in fact. Um, Niels, maybe I can yes. tell people a big secret that we wrote a book together on European monetary integration. And I learned uh, most of what I know about Europe from you. And in our book, I seems to me to remember, I seem to remember that we were actually uh, well, uh, quite hawkish on the need uh, to keep uh, debt levels low uh, through uh, appropriate uh, um, fiscal policy, which should be on average uh, having a budget imbalance. Have you become more lenient? Maybe I have, that's uh, absolutely true. Uh... Uh, there are a couple of factors, of course, that uh, would make uh, sustainability a bit easier to live with. We seem to have lost Niels. The European. Bad connection. Let me see. I can, Commissioner, still there. Let me just say to those who are connected that there is a question and answer button. So you can put uh, questions. Um, I don't know whether the commissioner can see them. Um, I will just uh, perhaps waiting for Niels to reconnect, uh, put uh, one question uh, which is to you, commissioner, um, which is uh, one on the rule of law. Um, or say uh, how it could be uh, applied and implemented, um, and whether uh, this new approach to expanding the EU budget uh, could uh, change from being temporary uh, to something uh, which becomes permanent and basically a stepping stone to future integration. 
and risk sharing? Uh, uh, yes, thank you to, to very good and a little bit challenging questions. Um, uh, the first, uh, which is not, um, um, which was one of the three or four main uh, issues on this four days uh, discussion, I think at the end was uh, uh, solved in a reasonable way, uh, which is, uh, as you know, that uh, the principle is uh, that uh, we're not lost confidence in the concept as a whole. Yes, we have advanced a bit, and I'll give you the, the chance to come back later. Why let the commissioner finish something and then we come back to you? Uh, uh, so the the in the final text, uh, what was uh, agreed after uh, very difficult discussion uh, is that the, the, the commission, I read, uh, will propose measures in case of breaches for adoption by the council by qualified majority. Uh, this is um, uh, something that, um, as far as I understand, is uh, a uh, not exactly what uh, was initially proposed, but a good uh, solution, because it gives uh, to the Commission the right of initiative in case of uh, breaches of the rule of law uh, and um, a right uh, of initiative um, with proposals to be approved with qualified uh, majority uh, vote, then we will be in practice how this uh, could be uh, made uh, operational. Uh, uh, second um, uh, question, uh, my answer is very uh, clear. This is uh, a, um, an extraordinary um, uh, decision, an extraordinary tool, an extraordinary instrument. Uh, I uh, uh, understand and appreciate um, what the EFB report uh, says that this uh, extraordinary intervention should be morphed into uh, permanent instruments. Um, uh, but this is not what uh, uh, the Commission uh, proposed and the Council approved. What the Commission proposed and the Council approved is a uh, ad hoc and extraordinary measure. Then we know that history uh, is also built on precedent, uh, but um, conditio sine qua non to have discussion on this issue is that the plan we approved yesterday works. Uh, if it works, if the implementation uh, goes, if the repayment goes, if the plans are really coordinated for a future-oriented objective, I think that a discussion of this kind could be open in the next years. If this conditio sine qua non is not applied and the plans doesn't work, I think it will for sure be uh, a uh, one-shot operation. Okay. Um... As usual, now we have a, uh, a lot of questions. Let me just uh, perhaps uh, try to group a couple of them and uh, address that also then to Niels in the context of the interaction between high debt levels and investment. Um, so one question was basic, basically whether we are going into a, a union in which there's some centrally planned uh, investment uh, plan um, by the EU and national governments and uh, whether, and that I would add to that question, whether you would allow a higher debt level for a country which invests more. Mm -hmm. Niels, perhaps I first ask you to, uh, to answer that also in the context of what you were trying to say earlier. Please unmute yourself.
Okay. So um, the uh, European Fiscal Board has earlier been on record saying that uh, in the national fiscal rules, there should be uh, an allowance in collecting the deficits and in interpreting the, de the uh, debt levels uh, as a function of the investments undertaken. So you can say that we were trying to adopt something like what is called the golden rule in some national systems where uh, investment is protected. It does not lead to uh, uh, corresponding tightening of policies. So the uh, balance uh, of uh, public finances that is relevant is the one between current expenditures and uh, uh, financing and, and revenues. So uh, in that sense, yes. Uh, so the, there is, there would be that kind of, of uh, differentiation. Uh, yes, that, that would be our, our view also in terms of what is being proposed at the European level. Uh, so, yes. Uh, thanks a lot. I have a couple of questions which are sometimes very technical and very political, uh, but perhaps I can mix the two uh, by asking the following to the commissioner. One question was very, if you want, political. <clears throat> um, what will be the role of national parliaments in preparing these national recovery and resilience plans? And I presume uh, if the national parliament has given its vote, how can the EU basically override the sovereign uh, in uh, a nation? But connected with that is uh, something which uh, I think economists uh, very often emphasize and which is uh, neglected usually at the political level, which is the fact that money is fungible. So uh, if you give money to uh, Italy to do certain things, uh, and if they had financed these things themselves, then the additional money from the commission uh, might best be used to reduce taxes, increase minimum incomes, or some other stuff. How do you think you can avoid that while still maintaining the sovereignty of national parliaments? Well, in fact, the, the, the two issues are, are uh, your two questions are very much, much connected, uh, more or less uh, they're the same one. And the point is, uh, I think that uh, we should all uh, take uh, for serious uh, what was decided um, yesterday morning after uh, such a, a, a long discussion, but also after a very short period from the beginning of the crisis. So it was also a, uh, we, we often say it's too little and too late. In this case, it was uh, rather fast and, and strong, this reaction, but we should take it seriously. And what uh, did we decide um, uh, the, the, the heads of state and government uh, being there on the mandate of their parliament, uh, we decided to uh, uh, link uh, this unprecedented uh, fund and uh, this unprecedented borrowing uh, from the commission uh, to national uh, plans with clear uh, uh, framework and these clear framework are clearly mentioned in the decision taken yesterday and we have uh, four uh, keywords one is um, country uh, recommendation of the semester the second word is resilience the third word is uh, green sustainability and the fourth is uh, digital uh, transition. Uh, uh, then I know I am I know that uh, governments and parliaments have a, a parallel track that probably could also be really parallel uh, because they could also uh, present their draft uh, national recovery um, and resilience plans uh, in parallel with their draft budget of 2021. Uh, and in, in this uh, parallel track, uh, there are uh, 
a, a large uh, autonomy for parliaments to uh, decide um, any um, measure that they uh, believe is useful for their country. So the ownership of national parliament and governments in this recovery plan is very clear, but it is clear in a uh, agreed framework. And the agreed framework is the one we uh, decided uh, yesterday. And I'm fully confident that um, we will be able in dialogue with member states to uh, implement this framework. Otherwise, we will, I repeat, lose this opportunity. But when in doubt, you could override a national parliament. You could, tell a, you could tell a national parliament your plan is not good. Uh, I, th I think that we, we will have a dialogue with national parliaments uh, because uh, I, I, what we should exactly avoid, and in this sense, the dialogue is crucial and uh, for the commission, it's a real challenge. Uh, you, you should never arrive to a moment where there is a formal plan approved by the parliament and the formal uh, decision uh, against it. Um, we are there to uh, work to uh, build uh, a consensus and the idea of the consensus is based on ownership from member states and their parliaments, but within the framework that we agreed. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, let me come back to uh, another issue, which I think you have probably um, been already confronted with uh, several times, namely uh, the emphasis uh, on uh, growth enhancing uh, measures, uh, the digital uh, innovation part, and the fact that in the MFF, uh, the future oriented parts, for example, Horizon Europe, have been cut, at least with respect to the proposal, and even, let's say, not increased with respect to the last MMF. So it seems to me difficult to convince people that uh, uh, all this uh, new money will really enhance uh, the competitiveness of Europe when the one part which is really going to the heart of it and to the heart of the, the sector where Europe is really lagging behind, namely the digital sector, where one doesn't see uh, any real uh, fiscal or financial effort of the union. Uh, well, the, the, I, I don't know if, if, you, if you want the... the uh, which half of the of the glass you, you want uh, the, because we have of course two different uh, uh, parts Be of course uh, we uh, regret uh, the fact that uh, um, at the end to reach an agreement uh, some decisions were taken on rebates and on cuts of uh, a certain number of, uh, so to say, innovative program uh, that the Commission had in, in our proposal. And uh, I know that also the European Parliament is uh, strongly regretting this. Uh, at the same time, and this is the, the other uh, part of the, of the glass, is uh, that if we look to the overall picture, um, uh, which is the uh, MFF uh, and next generation EU, so the 1.8 trillion uh, euro, um, uh, you see uh, more or less uh, the division, 50% of this uh, money is on the two traditional uh, agriculture and cohesion policy, and 50% is for uh, innovative policy. Uh, and as you know, uh, traditionally in the MFF, uh, two thirds was in agriculture and cohesion and one third in other policies. So sorry to make this 
uh, a little bit simpler than it is because it is uh, very complicated and also with, I repeat, regrettable decisions. But overall, in uh, Europe, we never had such a large amount of money for uh, investment in green, in digital, and in future-oriented initiatives. Then it will be our role to make this uh, clear in the implementation phase. Um, I, I know that uh, there has been progress. I used to think it was glacial, at a glacial pace, but maybe with global warming that can accelerate a bit. Um, but you will understand that uh, not academic uh, economist like me looks first of all at Horizon uh, Europe, and that is the one program which uh, seems most directly relevant for research, and that's the one which unfortunately has not been increased, uh, to say the least. Um, but no, no, to say the truth, yes. it was not increased. <laughs> Exactly. Um, so let, let me come perhaps in concluding to one aspect uh, which uh, we have not discussed so far, which is the link uh, between uh, uh, this unprecedented uh, decision to issue very large amounts of EU bonds and the international role of the euro. Um, as you know, uh, many people have said that uh, one of the reasons why there is no uh, why of the reasons why the dollar has so much stronger international role is that there is no European safe asset uh, or no or few European safe bonds. Uh, they're just the triple A ones, which is Germany, some other smaller countries, with uh, France not clear where it stands or where it is put by the rating agencies. And now we would have a much larger supply. Um, a, do you think that uh, the international role of the euro will be enhanced uh, by this uh, existence of uh, a new uh, form of European debt, or not new form, a much large supply of European debt? And B, was that perhaps one of the motives which facilitated this decision uh, at this weekend? Uh, yes, my answer is uh, definitely yes. I've, I've read something also, I don't know if yesterday or today, uh, in, uh, in FT uh, uh, on this subject, uh, if, I am, if I remember well, uh, uh, that this uh, can be one of the uh, consequences of uh, uh, what we decided because, what the, the head of state and government decided, because in fact, beginning next, um, I, I imagine end of September, beginning of October, with the first tranche of the 50 billion for the sure mechanism, which will be the first issuance from the uh, Commission. Uh, in 2021 and 2022, uh, the Commission will uh, uh, will be uh, one of the well, I have not an exact ranking uh, of the main. Um, issuers in uh, financial markets. Uh, and this uh, in, in itself is uh, uh, something uh, because of, of the triple A of the commission and of the nature of this uh, issuance of the uh, work uh, that is clear on the repayment um, and all the framework that we have uh, will strengthen the role of the single currency, which is something strongly needed, I think, if we look to the global picture of the next uh, 10 or 20 years. And you are confident that the Commission will retain its AAA, even if it has uh, 850 billion of bonds outstanding and a bickering uh, a set of member states uh, who don't want to increase their contributions? No, I'm, I'm definitely, absolutely, ultra sure. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Niels, uh, I presume uh, you also had some thoughts in the meantime. I will give you the final word, just very briefly. Uh, on the... 
I think we have lost uh, Niels again. Where there is. Uh, then I think I will take this as a sign that we should uh, conclude. Um, I think your last words were very clear, Commissioner. You're absolutely sure the EU will stick together and uh, will be able to convince markets that will honor its, uh, its uh, commitments. And that betrays also the fact that you are confident that this plan will work. So I think on this positive note, uh, we can conclude uh, this meeting. And uh, I hope to see some of you very soon again. Many thanks and bye-bye. Grazie.